Come on, put your hands together for Jesus in this place. Come on, you can do better than that. Put your hands together for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The, the book of Ephesians tells us that we are blessed people. And so often we think we're blessed because of the things we have. But if you read the whole chapter, it tells us that we are blessed because we have sonship and daughtership, meaning we are children of God. John says, because we believe in Jesus, we have been given the right to be called children of God. And so we can say, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Not because my money's right, not because my kids behave right, not because my fiance is getting things together. We are no longer a slave to fear because we are children of God. And if God is our father, if God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. Amen? amen. Come on, you can say amen a little bit better than that. Say amen. amen. Happy Sunday, Metropolitan Baptist Church family. My name is Arthur Connor Jr. and I serve as the lead pastor of this beautiful church. And I'm just so grateful that I get a chance to be the pastor, and I'm also grateful that I get a chance to share God's word. But I'm even more grateful that I get a chance to be a part of the family of God. Amen? Amen. So far, we've been going through this series called Grateful. Say grateful. grateful. Come on, say it a little louder than that. Say grateful. grateful. Declare it one more time. Say grateful. grateful. And in this series, we're examining a letter that Paul wrote to the church of Philippi. <laughs> He wrote this letter to the church of Philippi, and in this letter, he wanted to know that he was grateful. He was grateful for them, grateful that they were a part of the family of God, grateful that they were advancing the gospel, grateful that they were truly good brothers and sisters in the faith. He said, every little thing you do, you're on my mind. You're on my heart, you're in my prayers. And Paul said, not only am I grateful that we are a part of the family of God, but I'm grateful even for my circumstances, that in my chains, that in my trials, that in my suffering, I have an opportunity to point people to Jesus. He says, because of my chains, I'm advancing the gospel. And then last week, we learned that Paul is also grateful for the gospel. And he said that if we're grateful for the gospel, we show how grateful we are by living it out, by living for Jesus. And it requires that we get rid of some stuff, animosity and bitterness and greed and envy and jealousy and focus on the goodness of God, focus on the glory of God. And today we're going to turn the page a little bit, but before we do that, I want to stop for a moment and say on behalf of our pastors, it will be on the screen, I want to say thank you. We are grateful. We are grateful for your generosity. We know that October is the month of pastor appreciation. And so we pastors, uh, Pastor Arthur Connor Jr., Pastor Dwight Faircloth, Pastor Mark Hamilton, and Pastor Jerry Gallimore are grateful for your contribution and your love and your support and your kind words. And so I want to say thank you. Thank you for being generous. We don't take it for granted. Uh, you, you didn't have to do what you did, but you did it, and we are grateful. And so we just wanted to say as pastors, we thank you and we love you. Thank you for thinking of us. Amen? Thank you so much. So in, in this series, Paul, Paul wants to know that we are called to be grateful, and Paul wants the folks in the place of Philippi to know that he was grateful for a lot of things. Now, the first week, I told you about this man named Epaphroditus. Now, he, he's, a, he's a big part of this story because Epaphroditus comes, he comes to Paul and he brings a message, some good stories, some good news. The good news is the people in Philippi are still believing in Jesus. They're still proclaiming the gospel. He comes bringing some good news that people are getting saved in Philippi. But he also brought some bad news. And here's the bad news. The bad news is, was there were some false teachers that were saying that Jesus was not king, Caesar is king. That Jesus was a good man, he was a prophet, he was a good guy, but he's not king, he's not Lord, Caesar's Lord. 
And then there were others. And then the other drama that we see is that they had division in the church. In the church? Division in church? That don't happen. That never happens. We never have division in the church, right? Right? It, it ne that never happens. There's never like conflict in the church. Never. But in Philippians chapter 4, he, he talks about that conflict a little bit. There are two sisters who couldn't agree, couldn't, weren't, weren't on the same accord. And he appeals to them, and we got to get together. And so this chapter, this entire chapter, especially the first half, he's saying to us, we need to be united. And he reminds us why we should be reunited. If you have a Bible where there's paper or screen, would you journey with me to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, starting from verse 1. Uh, Philippians 2, you can turn your way there, you can type your way there, and if you don't have your own screen and glows, you can look at the screen on the wall. And let's read all of the 11 verses that we're going to dive into today, starting from verse 1. There's an echo that I hear in my mic. I would love for you some feedback. Please help me a little bit. Let's dive into the text. When you found the text, would you shout word? Let's, let's take a look at what it says. It says, therefore... If there's any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Isn't that hard? Isn't that hard to do at times? You guys are spiritual. You guys do that very well. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Verse 5 is very important. Says, In your relationship with one another, have the same mind as Christ. Verse 6, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Verse 8, and being found in the appearance of, as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave them a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth. And under the earth, and every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you feel comfortable, would you bow your head and let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, we thank you. Thank you that we are a part of this wonderful family. We who have placed our faith in Jesus are a part of the family of God. Now, God, would you use me for your glory? Would you speak? Would you teach? Would I be nothing more than a vessel that you're using to speak to my brothers and sisters, those who are also a part of this family? God, would you hide me behind the old rugged cross? Would you teach? Would you preach? Would you be glorified? Would you be exalted? In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Paul writes this letter because he wants us to be unified. And too often when we think of unity, we think that we need to be the same. Unity, unity does not mean uniformity, right? Like, we, we, we're not all the same. Say, I am different. And, and, and Dave Ramsey says, if you're in a marriage and you're both the same, someone might be unnecessary. <laughs> right? We need to know that we are different. We are all different people. Your daughter will not be you. I mean, you want her to have some of your values. You want her to have to, to know what it means to love God and to, and to know God and to have our own faith. But the reality is we're all different. We all think differently. We grew up differently. We are different people. But Paul writes this letter because he wants us to be unified. And so I start with a question. Have you ever struggled with unity? Have you ever struggled with being unified with someone who's a part of your family? If you're a husband or a wife, have you ever struggled with being unified with your spouse? No one ever struggles with that. Have you ever struggled with just being on the same page with your spouse? Have, has there ever been times in your marriage where there's a conflict and there's discord and there's disunity? Have you ever struggled being unified with your boyfriend or your girlfriend? 
Have you ever struggled with being unified with a brother or a sister? Like you love him to death, but you're just not on the same page. Like, you know, he might be off the chain or you might be the one who's off the chain. Meaning you're a little, you know, yeah, you get it. Have you ever struggled with being unified with a church member? <laughs> Have you ever, like, ha just kind of can't connect and be on the same page with a brother or a sister in the body of Christ? Maybe you sing on a choir together. Maybe you sing on a praise team. Maybe you're in the band together. Maybe you did a sit in your row and you just, you're just not on the same page. Are you? Have you ever struggled with unity? Be unified with a brother or sister, a spouse, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a, a brother or a sister. And Paul is saying, listen, I know there's struggle. I know there's discord. I know there's a struggle with being unified. And Paul says to us in the very first verse, he wants to remind us about who we are. He says, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Remember that you are a child of God. Remember, look, look at verse 1 again. He says, remember, it says, therefore, if there's any encouragement in being united with Christ, he's reminding us that we are united with Christ. And he says, if, if there's any, any encouragement in being who you are, one who is united with Christ, what does that mean? When we are united with Christ, we have redemption. We have been redeemed from the penalty of sins. That when we are in Christ, there should be encouragement that, man, I have been redeemed. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, is what churchy folks would say. That in Christ, we are not only are redeemed, but we are part of the family of God. Is there, is there any encouragement in being united with Christ? And then he goes on and says, if, if there's any comfort in his love. He says, not, he says, remember you're loved by Christ. That Christ loved you so much that he showed his love for us while we were messed up, while we were sinners. Christ died on the cross for our sins. If there's any comfort in his love. Then he goes on and says, if there's any fellowship with the Spirit, and if we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, if there's any fellowship with the Spirit of God, you should be encouraged. He goes on to say, if there's any tenderness and compassion, if you are, are you experiencing the compassion, the affection, and the compassion that comes from Christ? See, like, if you're not a believer, I want to ask you, what encourages you? What, what brings you encouragement? What, what in, motivates you in your time of your moments of discord and disunity and trials? What, what encourages you? But as a believer, Paul is saying, I want to remind you, you should be encouraged that you are with Christ. You're united with Christ. He loves you. There should be comfort in his love that we should know that because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we can have fellowship with one another, and then also we experience the tenderness and compassion of God, write this down if you're a note taker. If you're a note taker, I want you to write this down. It's the first point I want to make this morning. A grateful family is a unified family. A grateful family is a unified family. Paul says in verse 2, he says, then make my joy complete. Man, mean, make, make me happy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one spirit, and being of one mind. What Paul is saying there is, is make my joy complete by being united. Now, a grateful family isn't a perfect family because the reality is if you've been in family long enough you realize that families aren't perfect we all have a brother or a cousin or an uncle that you know you know you know you know we all have a sister that you know it's a little different we struggle with being in family and listen a, a grateful family isn't a perfect family Matter of fact, the moment you were born <laughs> and you were placed in that family, the family was no longer perfect. <laughs> you make the family not so perfect. Like maybe it was perfect without you, but the moment you came into the family, like it stopped being perfect. Man, we struggle with that. We struggle with that because we think, well, a, a, a perfect family or a grateful family is a family without struggles without conflict. Now listen, if you are in a relationship and you've never been in conflict, you don't really have a relationship. Like if we're in a relationship, like there's gonna be conflict, there's gonna be times where we don't agree, there's gonna be times where not taking the garbage out is gonna cause a ruckus. There's gonna be times when watching too much football is an issue. 
It's going to be time when you didn't say, you know, good morning, or you didn't bring a rose, or you didn't take her out to see that movie that she really wanted to see, and she gave you all those hints. She wanted to go see, <laughs> she wanted to go see Hamilton. <laughs> Some of you guys got that. But you couldn't afford a ticket. Let me stop. Listen, a grateful family is not a perfect family. A grateful family is not a family that doesn't have conflict. A grateful family is a united family. And Paul says to us, we need to be united. But you know what? Things divide us, like strife. Like, not my family or your family, but there are families where there's a lot of strife, right? There are families where our brother, brothers don't talk to one another because they're mad that, that mom died and left the younger one in charge. You don't ever have that, but, but there's some stories. Not in this church, other churches, right? Like, we're, like they're mad because mom left so-and-so in charge. Or, or there's families where folks are upset because they feel that, that my, my sister is a prettier sister and she's favored by mom. Mom likes her a little bit better because, you know, she looks in the world standard prettier than, than I. There's strife in our families, right? And strife hinders unity. Strife divides and conquer. Like, like Thanksgiving is coming up, and you're struggling with making the phone call to, to certain family members, right? Right? This one you can call and say, hey, what are you bringing? You're bringing turkey? You, you're, bringing, you're bringing, you know, uh, greens, peas, potatoes, tomatoes, yams, you know, you name it. But then there are others that you don't want to call. Like, matter of fact, some of you, you're not even going to call them. You know what you're going to do? You're going to say, tell your, your sister, can you call, can you call him and, and tell him if he's coming? He doesn't have to come. He doesn't, like, he doesn't have to come, but if he's coming, he makes a mean rice. I won't talk to him, but I'll eat his rice. So if he's coming, tell him to bring rice. And then don't have him call me, but then you call me back and tell me if he's coming and if he's bringing his rice. And if he's not bringing his rice, tell him stay home. Like, you, you have strife in your family, right? Maybe your family's perfect. But in this situation in the church, there was strife. There was strife. There's strife in the family. You know what sometimes? Sometimes we have strife because of vain glory. We're selfish. <laughs> you know, a, a pastor by the name of Rick Blackwood says that so often we, we cover up the bigness and the greatness of God with our small problems. And we cover up the purpose of God by thinking only of ourselves. And he says that the, the earth can fit in the sun uh, a, a thousand and three hundred times. That you can take this, if you, if you divide, if you added a hundred earths, uh, 1300 earths, you can cover the sun. It could fit in, into the sun. So there's a, a, the earth can fit into the sun a uh, 1,300 times. The sun is great. The sun is big. But we can take something as small as, uh, this, is, this is not valuable. This is like, it is valuable. It's an it's a EC money. It's from Anguilla. It's 25 cents, probably worth 5 cents. So if I don't, if I don't find it, it'll be okay. So we, we take something as small as a coin, and the closer we bring it to us, it hinders us from seeing the bigger picture. And he says so often we take our smaller problems and we bring them so close to us, that we miss the greatness of God. So often we, we're so focused on ourselves and we just, we just bring focus on ourselves so much that we miss the opportunity to love on others and to serve others and to care for others. And Paul, in the very next verse, in verse 3, says to us, he says, do not do, not do anything out of selfishness or out of selfish ambition or vain conceit rather in humility value others more than yourselves what is Paul saying Paul is saying we got to stop being selfish because the reality is you know what we do very well we're selfish we think of ourselves we focus on ourselves so often and Paul in the text says listen we should stop doing things out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but yet in humility we need to value others more than ourselves and so often we focus on ourselves and we think of ourselves and we can't love our brothers and our sisters one because we're selfish it's all about me it's all about I what I want I want this I want that I I I I I and God wants to kill the I <laughs> He wants to kill I, us. Paul says we should die to ourselves daily. 
But not only, not only the, does the eye stand in the way, not only do the, the we stand in the way of, of having folks see God, but, but also sometimes we struggle with loving our brothers and sisters in the faith because we have a hard time seeing them as brothers and sisters. And when we struggle with that, you know what we're saying? We don't think God's their father. When we have a hard time loving our brothers and sisters who are part of the body of Christ, what we're saying is that man, I have a real hard time, and God is my father, <laughs> but I have a hard time of seeing God being his father or her father. And, and we put up with a lot of things in our family. We put up with a lot of things in our family. Like, like there's some friends, or some folks who are in our family that are, that are off the chain, that are living a, a crazy lifestyle, and we don't talk about them bad because they're what? They're... Say it a little louder, because they're family. Like we don't, we don't beat up on them so much, we give them a break, we give them grace, we, we grade on the curve for them, our kids who are going in the wrong direction. Because they're family, we give them a break, we, we grade on the curve, but yet in the body of Christ, we talk about one another so bad sometimes. We beat up each other because we, we, we struggle with seeing each other as being family. And Paul is saying, listen, we are family, so let's stop being selfish. Let's stop doing things out of selfish ambition. Let's stop focusing on ourselves too much. Now, being selfish is when we focus on ourselves too much. And being humble or being selfless is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking about yourself a little bit less. Right? Now, it requires, like, Love South Florida, it requires for us to think of ourselves a little bit less in the month of November. To give three hours to go and serve, Right? To like stop watching, you know, uh, that show you watch, or put it on DVR, or to stop worrying about shopping. You know, sometimes we go to shop. Like my my, not me, but my aunts. I do sometimes too, but they're 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 not here, so I can talk about them. They're family. They'll spend like forever in their shop. They'll spend like five hours in one store. It's not a sin, right? Because you do it too. I want to challenge you this month to, to, to stop focusing less on yourself and let's figure out how can we serve others. Amen? Say amen. amen. So, so how, do we, how do we handle strife? How do we handle selfishness? How do we handle our vain glory when we think about I, 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 I? You know how do we handle that? Take, take a look at, at verse 4. Not looking out for our own interests but the interests of others. Verse 5. In your relationship with one another, have the same mind of who? So let me, let me show you a couple of things. Number one, this is the mind that Christ had. Uh, write this down if you're a note taker. When we are grateful for being a part of the family of God, we think of others, not just ourselves. If we're going to have the mind of Christ, we need to start thinking about others and not just of ourselves. Like, for example, as a church, how can we start thinking about others? This community, how can we start thinking about this community? How can we start thinking about our friends who are lost? What can we do as a church? How can we shift things around so that we can focus more on others and not just ourselves? Now, it's okay to do in-work. Like, we need to, to love one another and do inward work, but, but as the people of God, we have to also focus not only on ourselves, but on others. In Matthew 5, Jesus made this statement. He said, let your light so shine before men so that they would see your good works and glorify your God. Now, here's the question I ask you. Is light for light? What is the light for? Is the light there for the light? Is the light there for the light? No. The light is there to, sh to, to expose that it's in, that was in darkness, to allow those who can't see the ability to have sight. And so often, we are called to be a light in the world, but we want to light up each other. We want to light up ourselves. We are so focused on lighting up ourselves. And so we take the light that we have and we shine it on ourselves. But the reality is God is calling us to focus on others. The light doesn't focus on the light. The light focuses on other things. And as believers, we're called to focus on others. Why do we do that? Because of our example. Who's our example again? Christ. The example is not, is not, is not Faircloth or Dwight or, or Gallimore or Connor. It's Christ. And Christ was one who was selfless. He was focused on us so much that he came to this earth. And what he did, the word says he, he became nothing. We'll get there in a moment. And so listen, when you were single, if, if you, when I was single, 
I focused a lot on myself. I was, I was just so focused on myself. Matter of fact, when I was hungry, I would go to my favorite spot, Wendy's, and I would get me a number six. For those of you who don't know what number six is, it is a spicy chicken sandwich with tomatoes and lettuce, good enough mayo, and some french fries. And I would say, let me get a number six with cheese. And back in the days when I was single, we had this thing called biggie fries. And they would say, do you want a biggie size it? And I said, yeah! <laughs> and they would give me this big fries and this big drink. And one time this lady gave me this big, this big thing of fries, and it, it was biggie fries, but it had small fries in it. And I usually don't say anything, but that day I was like, hold on, hey, 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 hey! I told you to biggie size this. You need, what, what's this? And I would often, when I go and order, I would think about myself. Now, when I um, get hungry and I'm heading home, I can't be selfish. I can't think about myself because I have a family. I got kids who need to eat, and they eat too much. And so if I go to Wendy's and I buy everyone a number six, I might go broke. And so now I don't go to Wendy's that much anymore, as, much, as, as often. I still go, but not as, as often. Now I go to Pollo Tropical, and I get me the family meal for $12.99. That whole chicken, some rice and beans, and you know, I, I like planting, so I said, hey, let me get a side of planting. Yeah, that, that, that plant, that planting, woo! You know, and they're like, do you want anything to drink? No, we have drinks at home. <laughs> but, but what am I saying? My focus has changed. I now focus on others. I'm thinking of my family, and what God wants us to do is not just focus on ourselves, but think about others. He's saying to us, listen, have the mind of Christ and don't just focus on ourselves. We see it in verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking out for your own interests. Now, it's not saying to don't ever look out for your own interests. But it says not only looking out for your own interests. But how do you think about others? Like, it, it would be wrong... And I, I did it once in a while, and they, they tear me up. My kids are like, you're a pastor. How can you do that? You say you love God. They tell me just like that. I'm like, you want me to beat you? How can you bring Wendy's home without us? You had a number six. I can smell it on your breath. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, I ain't have no number six. <laughs> so you didn't bring us back nothing? You, didn't, you don't love us? You didn't think about us? That's not fair. Life's not fair. But you know my son is right, that I should have thought not just of myself, but others. And as believers, we have to start thinking of others. Say others. others. You see, when we think about others, we focus on others, on the family, on the community, on those who are in need. And listen, when we think about others, like those who are young, when we think about those who came before us, we have to think about ways how we can honor those who came before us. Because we didn't get here on our own. This building wasn't bought, they didn't just, we snapped our fingers and we had a building. There are folks who sacrificed and worked hard and prayed and fasted and, 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 and gave and gave and served. And, and so often when we, when, we, when we arrive, we think we got here by ourselves. But if, we have, if we're young in the faith or we're young in age, we got to figure out ways. How can we honor those who came before us? When we go to camp, it, it, it wasn't started by Tommy Carrington. There were those who came before him. How can we honor them? When we, when we see the things that are happening in this church, it wasn't because folks who just now come, it was those who came before us. And if we're going to really think about others, how can we honor those who came before us? And if you're older, I think we can also try to not just think about ourselves, but think about how can we help the next generation win? How can we position them to win? How can we help them to win? How can we push them and encourage them and not, and not try to stand in their way, not be a hurdle, but to be an encouragement? Not to be a hurdle, but to be a springboard. And you say, you know what? You can jump off my back and jump into the pool and swim for Jesus. How can we help the next generation win? How can we position ourselves as a church to reach the next generation and to help the next generation? When we think about others, it's about appreciation. It's about recognizing others. We start, need to start thinking about others more and ourselves less. Because when we focus only on ourselves, we miss the opportunity 
that's before us. When we bring our problems so close to, 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 to this and we focus more on our problems, we miss, we miss the story that we are a child of God and that we have a great God, a big God who loves us and who cares for us and he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Why would we set up on that word? Because he's not a liar. He tells the truth. We can focus on others. Say others. In verse 6, we see that he was focused, so focused on others that he surrendered his right. Here's what it says in verse 6. Who, by being the very nature of God, not considering equality with God, something to be grasped. I mean, he could have grasped on to his equality with God. He could have grasped on to saying, uh, you know, I am God, I have a right. But you know what he did? He surrendered his rights for others. I think that's one of the most difficult things we, can, we, we, we struggle with as believers. How can I surrender my rights so we can reach others? How can I surrender my rights as a neighbor to reach my neighbor? How can I surrender my right as a church member to reach those who are not yet a part of the fellowship of God? How can I surrender my rights to reach others? And when you do that, you know who you're, you're following? You're following Christ. Write this down if you're a note taker. Not only do we, when we are a part of the family of God, when we are grateful for being a part of the family of God, not only do we think of others, not just ourselves, but we serve. We serve. We serve. Where do you see that in verse 7? He says, rather than, rather than, rather, he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing. What, how, how can God make himself nothing? You know what he did? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He lessed himself, he, he lessered himself by wrapping himself in flesh so that we could have an opportunity. But he, here's why he did that. Keep going in the verse. By taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And here's why he did that. He, he made himself nothing so that he can come and serve us. Say serve. Now, as people of God, we're called to serve. Even when you have a fancy name in the title, like I remember when I was, young, when I was younger in the faith and I was, you know, started leading, they gave me this title called minister. And at one point I was like, oh, I'm a minister. Oh, I'm a minister now. When you look up the word, it's a Latin word that means servant. So they gave me this fancy title, Minister Connor. And all it meant was Servant Connor. I am Servant Connor. Who are you? I am Servant Connor. I serve the youth ministry. I serve the church. But we like to, to use the word minister. It, it sounds fancier like a Minister Connor. <laughs> I am Deacon so and so. Well, the right word also means servant. He calls us to be like him. He calls us to serve. That if we're going to be a part of a grateful family, we serve. We serve one another. We carry one another's burdens. We care for one another. We wash one another's feet. We serve one another. Why? Because the body, the family, isn't only focusing on yourself, but it's saying, how can I focus on helping others? He served. He served. Not only did he serve, uh, but he also uh, not just served himself, but he served others. How can, like, listen, on November 17th, we get a chance to serve our community. We can serve. You know, every single week, they need volunteers. They won't say it, but I'll tell you. Every single week, the food bank serves this community. And they're folks who have needs. They're folks who can't afford to go to Publix. They don't have a budget for Publix. And so they come to our food bank every single week, and they, they need folks who will be there to serve and to love on those folks in our community. Whether they speak English, Spanish, or Creole, whether they don't look like us, whether their skin is different, we get a chance to serve our community. You know, every week we get a chance to serve our kids in our nursery. And they won't say this, but I'll tell you, they need more volunteers. Who would serve? Who would serve our kids? And you might think, oh, it's only kids. Listen, you get a chance to pour into the lives of the next generation. What a privilege, what an honor to get a chance to serve the next generation generation serve God is calling us not just to sit on the pews but God is calling us to serve say serve yeah. it, it, you know I, I used to be a, a server I used to be a server and if you were and I used to also oversee servers and I remember in my meetings I would tell them as if you want to be a good server your job as a server is to make sure you know what your guest needs like, 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 if you just want to go there and just get it over with and move on, you know, you're not going to be a good server. 
But your job as a good server is to make sure you know what your guest needs. When you get there, what do you need? What do you want to drink? You want some soup? Do you want an appetizer? You bring them that, and the moment you get there, you don't just serve them and leave. You stop and say, do you need anything else? You bring their meal, and you, you might assume that they want, they, they have chicken tenders, you might assume that they want the honey mustard, and you bring the honey mustard, and you stop and say, you stop and say what do you need? They might tell you, um, you know, I don't like honey mustard. Can you give me some barbecue sauce? Can you give me some ketchup? It, it, it's, like, I hate being in a restaurant where the server don't know what I need, and I'm sitting there, and they just drop the plate up and then leave, and I'm like, oh, snap, I don't like honey mustard. I want ranch. It has less calories, and it tastes better, in my opinion. Humble but accurate. And they're waiting over and over saying, I don't need this. I need something else. And they take forever to take care of my needs. Listen, the ultimate server, Jesus, knew what we needed. We needed to be rescued from sin. And he came and met our needs. He knew we needed redemption. And so he came to meet our needs. He knew we were broken and we needed to be healed. And so he came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to meet our needs. Good servants figure out what do people need. What do our communities need? Yeah, I know they need Jesus, but what else do they need? How can we meet the needs of others? If we're going to be good servants, we have to know the needs of our community, the needs of our neighbors. I remember when I first came into our, my, our community we're in now, I built a relationship with my neighbor, and I realized that he worked. He's a cop, and sometimes they would call him in early. And I remember when the shooting took place at Stoneman Douglas, he was working overtime, and they would make him come early to go to Stoneman Douglas, and he didn't have someone to take his daughter to school. And I remember him saying, man, I don't know who's going to take my daughter to school, because now i got to go to be a part of this. i got to be all, you know, every, for the next two weeks, i got to go to Stoneman Douglas. And I said, you have a need? I, I, I can bring your daughter to school. I'll take her. Where, where is it? You know, maybe he did a background check on me. He said, okay, let me think about it. And then the next day, he's like, okay, I, I'll let you do it. You're a pastor, right? And you love Jesus, you know? You know, you know, all right, good. You know, hey, honey, when you get in the car, just call me, okay? And, and I took her to school one time and became two and three and four and five. And now whenever there's a need, we, we help each other in, with our needs. If I need a rake, I can borrow it. We help one another. We know what each other needs. Listen, if, we can, if you can meet the needs of people, we can have a chance to tell them of their greatest need their need of a savior, their need of a man named Jesus. We need to know the needs of our people. But he didn't just meet needs. Verse, verse 8 says, And being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on the cross. This is my next point. If we're going to be a grateful family, if we're going to be a part of this grateful family, we need to sacrifice. We need to make sacrifices. We need to sacrifice. Now, when I was young, I didn't realize it. But my mom was a young mom, and she made a lot of sacrifices. It's only now that I'm an adult and I'm a parent, and I got to feed kids, and I realize how, how, how expensive it can get, that I realized that my mom made some sacrifices. She was a very young mom. She had me when she was 17. And I remember wondering, why are we eating tuna fish helpers every single day? Tuna fish helpers every day. Tuna fish helpers, the one with cheese tuna fish helpers, and then the one with ranch tuna fish helpers, and tuna fish helpers, and tuna fish helpers, and tuna. I was getting sick. I said, if I get one more tuna fish helper, we're going to fight. <laughs> but I realized now my mom was making a sacrifice. It's, 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 it's cheaper to cook tuna fish helpers, and it lasts longer. And I didn't know it then, but I know it now that she was making a sacrifice for her family. Like, if we're going to really be the people of God, we need to learn to sacrifice for the family of God. We need to learn to sacrifice for the people of God. We need to learn to make sacrifices. And I know we live in this culture where it's about consumeristic and it's about me and how can the church help me and how can this do me, 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 me. But the reality is we need to learn to make sacrifices for others. If you're a parent, there's, there's moments in your life where you make sacrifices for your kids. And sometimes you wonder, these ungrateful kids don't know how hard I work to put them through. They think now they have arrived and they got degrees and they drive nice cars, but they don't realize the sacrifices that we made. Driving long hours, working long hours, saving money, robbing from Peter to pay to Paul. Some of you had to have pool hand. Some of you don't know what it is. Because without the pool hand, you wouldn't have survived and you were praying for, the, for your turn to come. 
we make sacrifices for our family members. And Jesus made a sacrifice for us. It's, listen to the verse again in verse 8. He says, and, he, and, and being found in the appearance of man, meaning he, was, he placed flesh on himself, he humbled himself. He sacrificed it by humbling himself and becoming obedient to the point of death. He sacrificed his own life for us. He gave his life so that we who were dead could be made alive. He sacrificed his very life. And some of us don't want to sacrifice nothing. We don't want to change nothing. We don't want to make a sacrifice to reach people. But Jesus says, you know what? I'm, I'm going to give my best. I'm going to give my life. And I'm going to be obedient to death on the cross. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to sacrifice to help you grow in Christ? What are you willing to sacrifice for you to grow in Christ? Are you willing to sacrifice 15, 20 minutes in the morning so you can read your Bible, so God can speak to you? Are you willing to sacrifice five minutes so you can pray either before you go to sleep or after you get up in the morning just to, for the opportunity to pray, not just for yourself, but pray for your brother who's, who's sick. Pray for your sister who's struggling with, with debt. Pray for your brother who's struggling in his marriage. Pray, pray that we make the sacrifice to, to get on our knees and pray and believe that when we pray, God hears us and that the God of the universe can do so much more on our knees that we can do in our own strength. What are we willing to sacrifice? What are we, what are we willing to sacrifice? Listen, if you're in a relationship, it's gonna require sacrifice. It's sacrifice. If you're, if you're in a marriage, it's going to require sacrifice. sacrifice. I remember when I first got married, I played dominoes three to four times a week. And my wife kind of smiled the first week. And then she said, you need to make a sacrifice. Like, you can't go play dominoes every single night. And now I only play like once a month, sometimes twice, sometimes twice. But I had to make a sacrifice. And you might, that's, that's a small sacrifice. It's not a big deal. Dominoes is not a big game. It is a big game. It's a big game. What am I saying? I'm saying that we, as a people of God, need to make sacrifices to reach people with the gospel. And here's what we sacrifice. Here's what we sacrifice, what we want, our desire, our rights, so we can reach people. Why? Because ultimately, it's not about us. Ultimately, it's about God being glorified. Look in verse 9 to 11. Let's read it together. It says, Therefore, God exalted himself to the highest place, and he gave him the name that's above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And don't miss that last part. To the glory of God our Father. Why do we serve? For the glory of God our Father. Why do we Think about others more than ourselves for the glory of God our Father. Why do we make sacrifices for the glory of God our Father? See, when we are grateful for being a part of the family of God, we glorify God. Dr. Dale, it is about the glory of God. It is about the doxa. The glory doesn't belong to us. It belongs to him. But when we're selfish, we focus on vainglory. And we're so focused on ourselves that we can't see anything else. We're so focused on us that we can't see there's lost people who need Jesus. We're so focused on ourselves that we can't realize there are folks who are far from God and they need hope. They need love. They need peace. Not, not the peace the world offers, but the peace that Christ offers because his peace is different he says the peace I offer the world can't give it's a supernatural peace it's a peace that goes beyond human comprehension so often we we're so focused on ourselves that we can't see the needs of others sometimes we bring our problems so close to us and we're so focused on our problems that we can't see the big God that we serve and God is saying to us would you serve, would you value others, even at times more than yourselves? Would you make a sacrifice so that we could reach people 
and ultimately, it's for the glory of the Father. Why do we do what we do? We do what we do because we want to glorify our Heavenly Father. Isaiah says that we exist to glorify God. Say, we exist exist. to glorify glorify God. This church exists to point people to Jesus. Ultimately, when we do that, it brings glory to God. We don't have to fear anymore. We don't have to be a slave to fear. Why? Because we are children of God. We are a part of the family of God. And Paul is saying to us, we'll be united. We'll be united. And how do we, how do we become united? My last point. Being grateful to God by following the example of Christ. Being grateful to God by following the example of Christ. Paul in verse 5 tells us that we're not following anybody else. We're following Jesus. We're following Christ. Because when we follow Christ, we can be united. Why? Because there is encouragement in being in Christ Jesus. We experience his love. Not only do we experience his love, we experience the compassion that is found in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, what I want to say to you, church, is let us be more like Christ. We can't be more like Christ when we're only focused on our small problems or when we only focus on ourselves. But when we allow these small things to get in our way, we struggle with following the examples of Christ. But when we not focus on our small problems, when we focus on a big God, we can live out the example of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, we point people to Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's my challenge for you today. How can I be more like Jesus? Matter of fact, would you write that down? How can I be more like Jesus? To give you get a little more practical, if you're married, say, how can I be more like Jesus in my marriage? And I want you to wrestle with that this week. If you're single, you know, you know who was single? Jesus. How can I be more like Jesus in my singleness? But you know what? Jesus is also part of the family of God. And so the last question I want you to wrestle with this week is how can I be more like Jesus to my family, the family that I was born into, and the family I was born again into, the family of God. This week, that's my prayer, is that you will wrestle with this verse one more time, and then wrestle with how can I be more like Jesus? How can I be more like Christ in my marriage, in my singleness, in my family, and in the family of God? God wants to be united, and we are united when we follow the example of Jesus. Hallelujah! I'm no longer a slave to fear. Why? Because I am a child of God. But you declare that, say, I am a child of God. Say, I am a child of God. Sing that one more time. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. One more time, declare that. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave to fear Cause I am a child of God And so Father, we thank you. We are grateful that we are a part of the family of God. And God, I pray today that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, who doesn't know you as Father, as 
Abba, as a good father. I pray, Lord God, that they would know that you died on the cross. You came so that they could come into the family of God. God, I pray that you would convict them by the power of your Holy Spirit to believe in Jesus. Because when we believe in Jesus, we are no longer a slave to fear because we are children of the Most High God. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Would you help me to see them as that? That you are their father. That you are their good, good father. And you are my good father. And they're my brother. And they're my sister. And you're calling us to not be perfect, but to be united. To walk in unity as we serve together. As we sacrifice together. As we don't just think about ourselves, but we focus on others. Ultimately for the glory of God. Now God, we thank you for this great time. May our time in the park be great. Whether we have 10, 20 people show up or 100, God, we want to have a time of fellowship and fun and just spending time with our family, the family of God. Now with him who was able to keep us from falling and to show us faultless before the throne of grace, to the only wise God, be all dominion, power, and glory now and forevermore. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Before we leave, if those of you who don't know where the park is, it's right down at Brian Piccolo. It's on Sheridan. And I think you have an announcement to make? Yeah. They need men to help. Lord the Father. Oh, and, and, and men, men who are part of the family of God, we need help loading the van with chairs and tables. So if you're a man and you have some kind of muscles or you're strong, don't leave without helping. Uh, many hands make light work. Have a great week. Take care. God bless. Love you.